Okay, so welcome to another episode of Breaking the Spell. And uh, we have here Shanta Mayanandi as our guest, and Santosh, my co-host, who will do yes. the introductions. Yes, thank you, Ansu. And uh, hello, Shanta. It's a privilege and a pleasure uh, to have you on our show. Shanta is currently dialing in from Paris in Europe. And um, so I've written a long list of things to, to make sure I do justice to what an amazing person Shanta is. So Shanta is an environmental lawyer turned sustainability and well-being speaker, facilitator, writer, and micro-adventurer. <laughs> she is the co-director and founder of the Think and Action Lab, Finding Sustainer, and UNESCO award-winning think tank known for its 30-day sustainability challenges. Shanta was voted best sustainability blogger in Germany in the top 100 sustainability influencers ranking of the Triodos Bank, as well as being part of the Selective Future Women Network. She's a proud member of the Think Tank 30 of the German Club of Rome. She co-authored Seven Virtues Reloaded, Applying Classical Virtues to the Demands of Tomorrow's World. She got featured on the Huffington Post on how to stop buying clothes for a year. We can talk a bit more about that later during our Breaking the Spell episode. She's currently based in Paris and speaks German, English, French, and Bengali on a daily basis. In terms of relevance to our show, Shanta has this innate ability in balancing the polarities between her yogi Hindu background and her German Cartesian thinking with hands-on scientifically backed tools. As a coach, she helps people uncover the inner stories and scripts that limit them from blossoming to their fullest potential. For example, uncovering our inner gaslighting and unleashing our inner superhero. A question she often ponders about is, how do we create the alchemy of reciprocity and win-win states for individuals, groups, and the world. So welcome, Shanta, to our show. Our Thank you first... so much, Santosh, for this amazing introduction to me. I'm, um, I'm blushing. I think people can probably see it. <laughs> yes, you are amazing. So Shanta, the question we usually ask our guests is, do you remember the first time in your life when you realized that things should not have been the way that they should have been? This is a very good question that brings me instantly back to childhood. And I think it started with me being in secondary school and boys doing these votes on who is the most beautiful and who is the most ugly girl. And I happened to be voted most ugly girl. And I remember how that made me feel. I remember that I both felt ashamed, but I also felt that women shouldn't be judged in this kind of way. And, and, and trying to discern myself from that and at the same time being part of something or looking to be part of something. That, that brought up a lot of mixed emotions. And already then, I was probably 10 years old, I decided that I don't want to give over my power to these boys. Wow, that's <clears throat> what a horrible experience to go through. I mean, that makes me think of how like a uh, Facebook started, you know, with, as a yeah, uh, way for people to rank each other. Um. Yes, um, the, the difficult part is, since we're talking about breaking the spell, who are you when you differentiate yourself from all your peers? Because this was my whole class. I was the only one who felt bad about this list or felt this is a wrong thing. I mean, obviously, I had probably the most motivation to um, not want to be on that list. And at the same time, I think it's something which is very inherent to our society, even though that's the list is obviously a very crude example, but who are we as women? Um, there's always some kind of label on us. And, and how do we work with or against that label or create new labels? And I think that's a really interesting question. I, I imagine there might, might be some parallel um, images that come up for you too as well. I'm growing up in, in very multicultural societies. Um, Santosh, do you want to talk about, you have some experiences, I believe. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I was uh, shocked when I heard what you said. And um, 
I was in like sorrow, like for a while. And uh, I was just trying to center and um, ground myself, like just after hearing what you said, because I could feel the pinch in my heart. Um, and it brought me back like memories from my own past for being judged for, yeah, for like so many things. Like I was studying uh, overseas and in, in France and I was being judged for being an Asian and uh yeah, this is like, uh, like lots of hurtful things I heard when I was uh, studying in France. So there's this colonial mindset, right? And I mean, you're in Paris right now, but <laughs> yeah, it's so strange. And um, yeah, it, like the military service, which applies so many labels and then like the, the label on boys, like you shouldn't cry, like you're weak if you're crying or yeah. Um, and then... Yeah, um, a few difficult and traumatic episodes in, um, in the government, like where I worked. Um, there were, yeah, but basically, I mean, having reflected on all of this, I realized there are certain models of success that we have in our societal norms and certain pathways to these models of success, which are, you know, just socially constructed. And they are also the pace. They are like socially constructed um, agreed upon pace, the pace at which you need to uh, uh, achieve one, one milestone to another. And I found all these constructs are just like labels. And um, yeah, a huge part of the work I want to do is to like enlarge the models for success, enlarge the pathways to success and enlarge our notion and our understanding of pacing as well. If I may add something, what I find very interesting is that um, so in Germany, at first, I was that lanky teenage Asian girl with 10. That, but when I went to India, I was suddenly this very beautiful, um, pretty white girl. And, and people, they, they stopped me on the streets to take photos of me. So that was a completely parallel universe for me. And that also really shaped me because both of it just felt very wrong. And the compliments I got was that I have such a clean looking skin. And, and that just also um, triggered some kind of hurt in my heart because that meant other people look dirty. And that's something where I realized we need to be careful about these kinds of labels. And we need to walk through life with values, but also be careful about, about what, what kind of tight labels we want to give to others. And I, I also think it's really hard to be a man nowadays no matter what, because also these labels, they feel very tight. And I've, I've noticed that because as women, we can be sometimes very angry at men. At the same time, I think it's like a, yeah, a, as you said, a, a game of polarity um, where we can't quite get out. And I think all of us are suffering either explicitly or subconsciously. Yeah, I mean, I think that the thing about labels is that they're just very static, whereas, you know, uh, life is just so much more fluid. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think uh, I have discussed elsewhere that uh, even compliments can be quite damaging because all of a sudden, like, you know, that's something that you need to live up to. Uh, and you're not free to fall short of, you know, this, I don't know, projection that people have on you. Um, so, yeah, and this is something that Santosh and I talk about a lot about you know how the the indigenous worldview is much less about static labels and nouns and more about verbs and relationships and things in motion yeah um like in ancient wisdom as well um i mean when you look at the ancient languages uh, even in chinese the notion of like future um or the past is not as uh, strongly evident or um, in the language, and even in uh, in in, uh, in in Sanskrit or in Hindi, like you know, yesterday and and yeah. So the, the idea of like time is um, is is something that um, like yeah, the ancient wisdom has has pretty beautifully encapsulated in that it's it's constantly evolving. Like we are constantly evolving, and. Um, yeah, um, the indigenous tribes in, in like Southeast Asia and how like women could play manly roles of like fixing the boats. Yeah, and then all of a sudden they can 
shift to like maybe uh, cooking a meal and yeah so all of this was very fluid and it was um it was very different yeah um in in the ancient scriptures also like this idea of who you are i think we will be talking a bit more about identity right so like yeah they 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 do say that we need to discriminate between what is changing and what is unchanging what is unchanging is the eternal and infinite self or soul that we are all uh one with yeah and what is changing is this body which is changing every 6 7 years you know the mind is always changing with its likes and dislikes and yeah so yeah the, the in the ancient scriptures they do mention this like duality of what is changing and be mindful of what's changing and what's not changing yeah and be always identified with what is not changing the eternal yeah the, the awareness that is aware of everything that's happening right now yeah i would i would like to pick up on something that ansu just said and that is about um compliments or insults um or criticism I think it's really important to complement processes so that's also what I try to do with my kids for instance um saying I admire that you put so much effort into drawing that drawing as opposed to this is beautiful and the same um it's very easy because I can see with my daughter when she draws something she instantly wants me to label it as good and as parents we always say it's wonderful but um I think we are giving um rewards for the wrong thing um and and i think it really starts with child rearing um and of course we can untrain ourselves we can unlearn certain things that have been given to us since childhood in i can i can say i'm i'm an asian i'm an asian indian woman and my parents they put a lot of um value into good grades and uh, being a good person there there's like a very big moral pressure as well and also differentiating myself from that i mean keeping the good parts and at the same time also seeing okay i i'm deviating from that and and also uncovering the shame that accom accompanies change and at the same time embracing it and kind of going into a conversation with that um is at first painful but then also very rewarding once you start to um embrace these processes on a constant basis Yeah no I I agree with you about like needing to uh relearn those old habits it's it's really hard for me I mean I'm constantly praising my children as well and you know before I catch myself but uh yeah I think it, it these habits are just so conditioned into us that um it takes a lot of effort to relearn the language Yes. on the flip side i have difficulties accepting praise <laughs> like or compliments and yeah it's just yeah i think the shame uh i don't know it's part of maybe a cultural conditioning shanta like yeah like when you receive praise you shouldn't you should deflect it you shouldn't receive it because i don't know you don't deserve it or something like that like sense of like worth is intertwined with receiving praise like um Yeah so these are some things that I I myself struggle with as well. Santosh may we start breaking that spell in this very moment because I think <laughs> you're a wonderful unique person I've never met you in person but um in every call we've had there was one or two or five phrases that have um have really given me a lot of food for thought you're inspiring you're kind and um even through video camera you know how to um, transfer warmth And that's something really beautiful about you and um so nerve-wracking it's so uncomfortable <laughs> well let me make you more uncomfortable oh, no. i mean you <laughs> really are I think like you, need it. Person, you know uh it's uh your sincerity and generosity um yeah just shine you know and and you're you're so yeah uh i don't know supportive of people around you So you're a gift and a blessing. It's instantly something that makes people trust you because they feel you're authentic and true and have their best interest at heart and that's something um I hope you'll always keep there's something childlike to that and and you're super smart as well, you know. Yeah. Thank like you the whole package Santosh honestly. Like <laughs> oh my god this show is not about me it's about you shanta oh my god <laughs> i thought it's a trilogue 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 yeah
Thank you so it much. Was a yeah. Fantastic moment. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's uh, yeah take the spotlight off Santosh for for a minute. Uh, Shanta, I, I am curious about the you know your different uh, multicultural influences. Uh, yeah, I just find it really interesting, and I'm curious what was it like you know for you growing up in Germany? You know, apart from some of those unpleasant experiences. So, while I was growing up, it was pretty awful. Um, but that motivated me to get out of that bubble because I had that sensation that things can be different elsewhere, even though what happened is that I started glorifying that elsewhere. So when I was 15, I instantly took part of, uh, in an exchange program to the States, to Australia. And after my um, graduation from school, I, I started living abroad, studying in different places. And um, now I can say there was some kind of escapism and some kind of identity searching to that um, at the same time it has helped me very much in shaping a more fluid identity because I always knew I don't belong but now I understand more that this not belonging is part of my identity and this makes me being able to converse not only in different languages but also with very different backgrounds and cultures and people and have that curiosity and um, what my adverse childhood experiences have also taught me is to not judge people by its by their cover and also to never make someone feel the way they have made me feel and so I, I do look for for the precious something in people and that has just helped me to keep some kind of magic in my eyes and in my perception of people. Um, yeah, no, that's really beautiful. I mean, how, yeah, you turned adversity into um, a precious strength. It is, there's, there's obviously always a shadow to that. Um, it's hard for me to really settle down, to really grow roots. Um, and I think there's a part of me that longs for that. I think ever since that uh, COVID crisis, I've realized that need that I need some kind of a sense of a tribe. I have really good friends, but that sense of tribe is something I have avoided. Um, I've always worked for myself. Um, and I realized part of that is my nature. I'm, I'm, I'm a born freelancer and I'm a creative person. But another part was also fear, um, fear of the consequences, what it means. I think it was avoiding what I have experienced as a child of not belonging, of being um, bullied for my differences. Um, and, and that's something I had to break and I'm still breaking that spell. Um, at the moment, I'm building up the startup with two really good friends of mine, which has also stretched me in a good way. And even meeting Santosh on the way, that's happening. So I'm meeting more and more people who have these certain traits in common, um, who, who want to leave a positive imprint on this world, who have a sense of spirituality linked to technical subjects. And at the same time, I think we all bear a little bit of pain in us as well. And, and I think there's a lot of positive potential behind that pain if we don't let ourselves be numbed by it. So in, in all the places that you've been, like where would you say were the ones where you felt the most belonging to? Have Has any come close for you? Yes, I'd say Istanbul. This really brought together my European and Asian age. I felt very welcomed. People, um, I mean, there were a lot of shops. They just kept inviting me for tea. There were just all these people looking out for me, caring for me. Um, and at the same time, what this place also brought to me is kind of curating the parts of me I can show. Because for them, I was part of their family. So I have to abide to certain norms for a good girl. So there were certain things which are recognized in myself, my reactions. And after Istanbul, I moved to London and that had an opposite effect because there was in this big wide world and everyone can be as he likes. You can go out in a, um, in a pyjama, you can go out in a suit. And this kind of freedom also shaped me. Um, at the same time, 
in London, it's, it's a very transitory place. So I've seen a lot of people come and go and there's something to that as well. Um, and I always, I have always thought in dichotomies. Um, so either there's this freedom or there's this family be belonging, but I think it's possible to create something which has elements of both. Hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, uh, like Santosh mentioned that uh, I've been to Burning Man quite a number of times and, and done, you know, a documentary about it. And what's interesting is that for me, Burning Man is one of the places where I feel most at home. Uh, and it's interesting, it, it's actually quite a common phenomenon of for people who go to Burning Man, so much so that when you go back to the festival, the, there are greeters at the gate and all of them will just say, welcome home. Uh, and, you know, this is in the middle of a hostile desert. Um, but I think what makes Burning Man feel like home is just uh, people are at their most authentic while they're there. I mean, there's no judgment. Uh, you can be anything or do anything. And there's very little judgment. And I think that sense of freedom from judgment and the, the ability to just express who you are uniquely is what, I don't know, uh, gives that feeling of being at home. Um, so yeah, no, I, I just wanted to share that. I was just wondering, is it because it's a finite period of time that it does that with you? Or do you see it as a model for a society that could, a community that could just work and stay like that? So there are some extreme experiences. So as Sandra said, I'm a micro adventurer, so I like to do some extreme things that take me out of my comfort zone. Um, but it's not something I would like to do all the time. Um, and because there's a finite nature to it, it, it is very powerful. Whereas there are some experiences that would be ideal to kind of continue having on a permanent level. Yeah, no, I think that's an open question. I think a lot of people are asking that, uh, whether Burning Man's power is because it is a transient and temporary thing. And there have been uh, communities that have tried to live the Burning Man ethic year round. Um, and some have been more successful than others. Um, but yeah, I think I think that's an, an ongoing exploration. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what a micro adventure is. <laughs> like, what are some examples of micro adventures? Um, micro adventures are small adventures you can do on the on a daily basis or without um, traveling to the other side of the world um, and it can mean something for everyone else so if you're afraid of learning english which i think neither of you are but if that's your fear go to a language class go to a conversation class um, it, ca it can be something physical it could be driving it can be anything um, and uh, it can be if you are afraid of going of, of being alone, going to the nature to the nature for two days. Um, now I used to be someone who did it more on a bigger level. I I, I love um, I love traveling. I love doing different things that take me out of my comfort zone. Um, but linking that with sustainability and also a sense for the quieter things in life. Have, have brought me to that um, to that pathway of, of looking for the finer and smaller voices. But I had to get uh, get the louder voices out of the way, way first. Hmm. Oh, that's great. I love the concept. Did you coin the term microadventures or is that something uh, that's kind of out there? Um, so we, we coined, at least in German, uh, self-challenges, and then it, then it turned out to be more and more micro-challenges, so I, I, I guess the term is out there as well. I'm, I'm not sure. That's great. No, I, I, I love the concept. And I guess this, this gets us into a lot of your work, which is sustainability. Like, how, how did you get into put sustainability personally? Um, so I already grew up with the subject of fair trade. My mother was working uh, voluntarily in a fair trade shop and then we heard we should never buy from Benetton or McDonald's. And um, and then as a, as a school kid, I also volunteered at that fair trade shop. So some kind of social um, awareness was always in the package of my upbringing. And, um, and so also 
so I was I was part of an Indian community, which was a bit more spread. So in my city, they weren't Indians, but uh, they had high hopes in me. Um, they felt I, I would be the next Gandhi. No pressure there. And um, <laughs> and by the way, I'm not the next Gandhi, but um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think I felt slightly pressured to study law. I mean, there was the option of uh, medicine and law. And I was kind of, I, I was the oldest kid and it was like very high hopes in my person. And, and it was also always clear that I want to do something good. So at first I thought it's something, it's going to be around social justice. Um, but then um, I stumbled upon, I have an auntie, she's German. I've known her since I was born. And at that time I was visiting her a lot and she was working as an organic farmer on a, on a beautiful farm, which became my, my first experience of relaxation, not very far away for me. Relaxation meant I need to take the flight to somewhere far, but I was just in this countryside and I had almost no network, no internet. And, and that really shaped me. And I went there so many times. And I think that kind of brought me closer to the whole subject of sustainability. And that's also part of why I specialized on sustainability, why I started um, um, they, over there in this little village. Um, there was this Canadian farmer who had sued Monsanto. Um, and he, he gave a talk and that also really shaped me. And so I felt I need to write my thesis um, on, on, on uh, anti-GMO and, and all of that kind of, um, make me more and more passionate about the subject. I wasn't aware at that point that I would deviate from law and do something completely different. But um, yeah, this, this is what brought sustainability into my sphere. Fascinating. I, I mean, speaking of law and um, capitalism, I think uh, Ansu had an amazing question about law and capitalism and how um, law actually writes the code of capitalism and extraction and how lawyers, um, how the law systems in, in especially in the, in the US, in your, New York, the New York state law legal system, as well as in the UK legal system, that's where most of, um, that's, that's the, the genesis, or that's where the source of a lot of the other like legal frameworks and everyone attunes to that standard. Whereas uh, the one that is in, uh, in Germany and France, that is uh, uh, slightly a lot, a lot more accessible and a lot more inclusive in its approach to, to, to law as well. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, yeah, there was a question like, was it about rewriting the code of law for, for capitalism, for extraction? And, and maybe you saw law as a, a means to doing that, rewriting the code, because if a lot of these quotes were favoring extraction and the capitalist, then maybe that's also, yeah, there's, a, there's this saying, you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools. Yeah, but yeah, maybe law is a tool that you could dismantle within the master's house as well. The, the quote you just used, it, it's, it's pretty similar. To you cannot solve a problem by the same with the same mindset that created it, right? And that's also something I found as a young law graduate. I I wanted to uh, use my legal trained skills for the good, but my options were super limited. It was after the um, financial crisis, and my options were either in the building industry avoiding environmental laws or working for free. Um, and at an NGO and not really having much options and opportunities to, to further change. And I also realized that I'm, I'm just a small drop and you're so, um, when, you, when you are in a legal career, you're just so constricted. You don't really see the benefits of what you're doing. And, and so I, I really wanted, there was something I, I was burning. I was like a young 20 something year old and I just wanted to change the world, which is kind of arrogant, but um, we, there we are. And so I, I wanted, so I started to just research. I, I interviewed a lot of people. I was just walking through London and just discovering so many approaches to sustainability. I wanted to understand 
And maybe I wanted to crack the code, what would make people as passionate and as enthusiastic and as curious about it. And I think um, what is the problem is that a lot of the legislation is very mental, but not sufficiently emotional. And I'm aware that there's a reason for that, but um, I think a lot of voices aren't heard. For instance, in agricultural laws, now I'm talking about the European Union, they don't really speak to farmers. And I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't started speaking to farmers and realizing how nonsensical a lot of that is. And it's not always bad intentions, but I also think it's really difficult when um, legislation is interlinked with lobbies and with economic interests. That just... Um, it just gives it a, a certain taste and also decreases potential for change. I mean, if our society is built on consumerism, our whole economic system, and it's clear that if we are trying to change that, the changes are going to be sweaty and painful at first. But um, if we are trying to just change little things within it, it's just not going to work. Um, so... This is why I have felt I can, I can do more opening people to, to, to open their hearts and also feed their minds with concrete steps. And you've, and been, doing this, my, sorry? And you've been doing this mostly through your blogging and these sustainability challenges uh, that you run. Is that right? Um, yes, so that started 12 years ago, and what I wanted is um, experimenting myself because it's very easy to go out there, guys, you're all immoral, and we, you all have to change. I know better, but I was kind of going in there, putting skin in the game and showing my own vulnerabilities, sharing my highlights, but also showing where it's really difficult for me, and that somehow did the trick. So I was doing it together at some point with a politologist from um, also from the think tank 30 of the Club of Rome. And we both had the same pain point. We wanted to be more sustainable, but also be part of that society and also understand how to, because it's one thing to say, Santos go plant-based from today. Um, it's also about like, but I like uh, egg curry and uh, how will I, so kind of listening to ourselves, listening to others, looking for alternatives, no shaming, humor. So we had to learn the process ourselves. And that's the thing. People started following us because we were authentic. They didn't feel guilt trip. They felt actually inspired to just try it because it was just about that. And um, so the self-challenges were a big part of my work and they still are. But um, I moved on to um, professionally give talks, consult. Because what I also did is I always try to learn more on different subjects. Um, so for instance, well-being, because that's something, at first I did it for sustainability for an extrinsic purpose to be more, more moral, but then I realized I feel better and better. And why is that? And so I studied the science of well-being where I just realized um, kindness, service, simplicity, community bonding, all of that massively increases our well-being. And um, because I have that le um, legal background, um, also government institutions listen to me. And so in some ways, um, all I've done kind of plays into me being heard. Yeah, That's can, really great, yeah. No, go ahead, Santosh. Yeah, I can see that like a huge part of your work is at the intersection of three things, uh, the environmental sustainability, and then you've got well-being, which it could be personal well-being. But thirdly, it's also social justice. And, and for you, these are three different things that are interlinked. Like they're not separate with one another. And I'm, I'm quite curious as to how like taking care of the environment is, in, is intertwined with taking care of other human beings, social justice, or taking care of myself, which is my personal well-being. I know it sounds strange. Like I, I, for me, intuitively, I get this because we all connect it somehow it's not just my connection with nature but my connection with myself and other people that can unlock this this linkages across three different separate dimensions which are studied very differently yeah so i mean i don't know if there are like some yeah 
how how did you arrive at this three different beautiful parts of your work, which is, um, yeah, which is what you do on a daily basis, from sustainability blogging to all of these other things that you're championing for. When we speak about intersectionality or interdependence, um, there are certain things we can see, and there are a lot of things that we can't see. And I used to also see these subjects as separate when I started to, however, my Hindu background kind of gave me another um, message, but I couldn't quite, I mean, as a lawyer, I couldn't quite pinpoint them yet. Um, but if you, if you look at it, um, also from a neuroscientific um, point of view, when you're stressed, you're in a state of crisis and that just naturally makes you less compassionate and less empathetic. And you'd be just less kind to the people around you, your close people, but also your further people. What, what does it also do? When you stress, you self-medicate. Um, what does it do? It, it can mean you eat unhealthily, you eat too much, which means you, um, I mean, those unhealthy food choices mostly cost the environment much more. Um, you consume differently, you buy blindly. I mean, all of that um, has real repercussions. And if you now uh, multiply it by billions of people, you can, you can imagine the, the, the vast effects only that has. Um, as opposed to when you're well, you have that patience to play with your kids. You have that patience to be kind to your spouse, to your people. You'll stop still to give money to a beggar. You'll help out in the soup kitchen. You'll consume differently. Um, so these are just the free states. Um, and then if that meets information, because it's one thing if you have that kind of inner state, that mental setup, but if you also know um, supporting local farmers Will help them survive you want them to survive and you and hence you don't want to buy from large corporations um, that will also change your way so we all need the the knowledge but we also need to have that prerequisite of kind of feeling so well and so thriving that we can pass on that love yeah no i, I agree that it's so important to have that immediate positive feedback you know, I think our, our brains are just designed to either like seek pleasure or, you know, something that feels good that, um, yeah, it's like, uh, I, I used to have pretty bad back issues and I would go, I would try yoga, I would try different things and a lot of it just didn't help. And then eventually just by luck, I came across this great Pilates instructor when I was living in San Francisco. And within that first session, she taught me some exercises that just made me feel good instantly. And then, so yeah, I would just do those religiously every day and I, I would keep going back to her. And, and you know, I, uh, I eventually, yeah, would spend years and years uh, training with her. And it was, it was just because my experience with her was just that instant positive feedback. I, I think it's just really hard to get people to continue doing something if it doesn't make them feel good at, at the end of the day. Wow. Ironically, we do a lot of things that don't make us feel good, or let's say um, we do a lot of things that make us feel good in the short term. We want quick fixes. We want um, um, yeah, very quick results. And hence it's easier to take, I don't know, a diet pill than kind of really eating healthily. There are all these, um, um, both of us is primed into our brains. Um, we have an um, inclination to love, to, to think on a deeper spiritual way and a community basis. But then there's also that survival instinct, which has a quicker reaction. And we can train the first one, um, the prefrontal brain, through meditation and through taking some steps back. There are some hands-on techniques to really go for that but in our society where we're working all the time we're in front of a screen the whole time and if we're not in front of the work screen we're in front of our phone screens and it makes it's it very screen. hard for us <laughs> it just makes it very hard for us to be in that kind of space and what the humans often forget is it's not always adding something so i don't need to add i don't know another meditation gadget or whatever sometimes it's also about removing things um that is um and we have a have a cognitive bias towards uh, towards adding <laughs> yes i i love that topic actually because i i read this book earlier this year called subtract 
by Lydie Klotz. You should look it up. But yeah, it's it's all about how like um, <clears throat> yeah we we just have this instinct for adding. And uh, the guy who wrote, I think he's an engineer, or whatever. But he stumbled upon this phenomenon just by mistake, like when he was playing Lego with his son, and they were trying to balance these two towers. He instinctively was trying to look for another piece of Lego, but they didn't have it. And so he couldn't solve the problem. And then his son was like, oh, let's just remove one piece, you know, <laughs> like, and then, and then so he, he created these experiments using Lego where he would go to just different groups of people with this Lego problem. And he found that the vast majority of people could never think of subtracting as a step. And I, you know, he came up with some interesting reasons for it. Like one of them is like, when I add something, it's easy for me to show my achievement. Hey guys, look what I did. But if you're subtracting something, it's like, you know, how, how do you prove your competence? And, you know, for social reasons, we evolve to want to show each other how competent we are. So yeah, I thought, I thought it was a really interesting book and it made me think, yeah, like we need to focus more on strategies that involve subtracting something interesting so we want to show how competent we are and i think there are other um pillars how we want to show so um what if you um as a man want to go part-time so you take care more of your children um all these things um i mean that I think once we do it we often um earn recognition but also going through that kind of external view on ourselves so almost like our parents eyes on us um it's it, it's so difficult and um so i have a certain level of education and um and that makes me um in in a certain um uh it, it just puts me into a certain group with a certain income with a certain expectation of whatever and and deviating from that isn't very easy and I, that that's something i've done all my life um, and so I'm pretty good at it. But for instance, I, I had this experiment. I had this really awful cracked phone, which just looked horrible. And my my idea was once it's one it once it doesn't function, I'll buy a new one. But until then, I will. And I I did observe the reaction. So I was I was giving talks and um, in these kind of high level events and taking out that phone confused people. Um, and, and kind of, and I could observe in myself um, a choice of feeling. Either I could feel ashamed or I could just take it with humor and I chose humor, but I already had a certain seniority for that. Um, and I can see it often when I give a talk that people come up with me, for instance, when it comes about um, sustainable gifting. Um, I love to, to give gifts for theater visits or some kind of, I, I, unless I know something, material which will really give joy I, I try to refrain from that and then people can I would love to give music lessons to my nephew but I feel I'm, I'm scared they would judge me if I do that that I'll, I'll appear cheap and all these kind of ideas they make it very hard for us to 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 initiate these changes that our soul longs for if I may say it in these words it's um it's so beautiful that you mentioned about well-being being the pillar of a lot of things because i think uh, this is really the agenda of the industrial revolution the capitalists and the the people who created consumerism uh, or consumption right so it's all about making us think that we have a hole within us a void within us get that can be filled with if we got if we bought this thing or we bought that thing, you know, or if we, yeah, I mean, if we went through the education system to get a certain job and be part of the industrial revolutions agenda or industry development of a country's agenda. Yeah. So there's always this stories that are being fed to us right from young that you're not whole and you're not complete, but to make you whole and complete, I'm going to sell you this thing. This is going to make you whole and complete. And so we latch on from one thing to another, right? And this is exactly what marketing does. The whole idea of marketing is to tell us like you are short of something. You're not whole and you're not complete. But hey, I've got this product that I want to sell you that's going to make you whole and complete. 
Yeah, and so it's all about creating a form of deficiency in someone else. And then the person feels down. It's like gaslighting anyway. So it's, yeah, I mean, you know, you just instill that doubt and the shame and then say, but I got a solution for you as well. Yeah, and what you're saying is we return to just take care of ourselves and social, like reconnect to the people around us. Yeah, then we feel whole and complete back again. Then we don't need to connect to devices, to people who are far away or, yeah, or the internet where addiction is rife, like addiction, because addiction feeds on this emptiness within us. Yeah, so it's, I, I feel like, yeah, in the whole trilogy of sustainability, well-being, and social justice, if you get the, the well-being right and the social justice, then, yeah, the consumerism, buying more falls down, then you take care of, the environment takes care of itself, naturally, because we buy less, we yeah, so we feel that we are, we are good enough. Yeah, so part of the, the education system is to make us feel that we're not good enough. Part of working in a corporate world is that we're not good enough. And to be good enough, I'm going to give you a career ladder and you need to go through this hopes, which are called promotions, and you do my bidding. Yeah, so it's beautiful how you've, yeah, you've captured all of this. Yeah, by well-being and feeling whole and complete. And the monks, you know, the monks, I mean, I mean I've, uh, I've learned so much from monks. Like, <laughs> for them, it's all about letting go. No possessions, let go. You don't owe anything. And they are the, cheer, the most cheerful, the most joyous, the happiest people. And this is so much in line with what Ansu said. Less is more. You know, subtract, remove. Yeah, and suddenly something dawns within us, a wholeness and a completeness from inside. Since this, um, this series is called Breaking the Spell, um, something popped up in my brain, and that is um, about reference points in the sense of well-being. Reference points are a very crucial element in our um, well-being. And now with the rise of social media, Instagram, and all of that, and we're not just comparing ourselves with uh, the village um, star, but with everyone else, with Beyonce and some film stars and our peers. And their lives obviously always seem much uh, more glamorous than ours. So we feel under the social pressure of performing with them. I mean, LinkedIn does that probably on another level, on a professional level. And um, we need reference points, but we need to choose them again wisely that brings us back to identity as well um if my um reference points are more value driven and also more experiential um i'm more prone to be happy and also if i am share more around the experiences people will feel less jealousy that's something really interesting they'll feel more jealous for a new car that i have than if i if i just share what a wonderful weekend i have had with my kids um, and that, again, shows the divide in our brain. Um, it's important that we also share more from the prefrontal brain and also connect more with people from the prefrontal brain. Because, for instance, in this conversation, none of us was talking, um, talking about what we all own or how great we are. We are really exchanging. And that in itself is already a conversation from the prefrontal um, aspect. And also choosing our tribe. So we are sharing because we find we have commonalities because we feel safe with each other. We don't need to impress each other. And that's, that's the kind of tribe I also want to be in, um, surrounding myself with people who, where I know they're just like me the way I am for all the good and the bad parts or challenging parts. So, you know, when you combine all this together, like I wonder where where you want to go next because i i know for me like i uh you know when you take all this into account it, it just feels like it um it's so very difficult to live these values in our current atomistic consumer society and i almost feel like i, I need to go somewhere off grid or find an intentional community to join where everyone is on, on the same wavelength. Um, I mean, where, where are you now on your path? Like, you know, you're, you're living in Paris, right? And uh, which is, you know, a big city. Do you, do you feel you're able to kind of really push uh, 
your sustainable lifestyle, uh, you know, even further? Or do you think uh, you'd be looking at some other type of setting? Um, this is an excellent question and really also describes, I, I, I will consciously call it my inner struggle. Um, so I have a longing to just go off grid, uh, live somewhere in the countryside and just kind of live my in my own bubble. And at the same time, I also feel very passionate about believing in the creation of the kind of world I want to see, of the kind of world I want my kids to live in. And I'm fully aware this is a David against Goliath kind of situation. And I also want to humbly embrace my small but powerful state and so what i'm trying is to connect the dots in myself and bring them together and create something which is um in accordance with the 37 year old shanta um and and so i um i teamed up with a small wonderful team um and we are creating, or we are working on creating the kind of community with experts or these kinds of elders. Um, but here I'm talking about uh, domain domain experts um, um, and 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 filling these gaps and and creating that kind of intersectionality exchange. So, for instance, I'm an environmental ad, an expert, and social justice is something dear to me. I've done a lot of interviews, but I wouldn't call myself an expert on that field. But I know experts and kind of bringing these people together and creating a learning experience. So we want to do, um, we, we want to create e-learnings, which, which are more accessible, but also bring these experts together. And uh, Santosh and us have already been conversing on it and he will also create some e-learning for us. So we are very excited about it. And maybe Ansu, we can also have a conversation about that. Um, Ansu is another wise elder, like, I felt that it's crazy and on philosophy, filmmaking, telling stories. And there is something else that he told me the last time that I've retained. It's about teaching chess, teaching kids chess. And Ansu, can you tell me a bit, tell us a bit more about your dream of having this costume party with kids <laughs> trying on different costumes and playing chess with their costumes? And I mean, it's amazing. Uh, yeah, no, not not quite a costume party, but uh, there were there was this uh, tutoring group in San Francisco and L.A. Uh, I can't remember what they were called, but they had a, you know, uh, very neat concept where they would have like a, in San Francisco, it was a pirate shop in the front. So, you know, customers could just go and buy pirate outfits or pirate ships or a message in a bottle. But behind the shop, there was a, a, a room where they tutored kids. So they had volunteers to teach the kids how to read and write. And because the kids had to enter through this pirate shop, um, they, it was filled with it. It was like a portal to adventure. So they, they looked forward to it. Um, and I always thought that that was really cool. And I always wanted to like start like a, a tutoring service, not tutoring, but like uh, an activity for kids where they could, it would either be teaching chess or teaching them reading and writing. And I, I felt this captured kind of like two, you know, very different personalities. Some kids might like the analytical part of playing chess, but others might, yeah, prefer the expressive aspect of storytelling. And so, yeah, it would, you know, and yeah, I had this idea that uh, it would could be like a costume shop and then they could walk in and choose a costume and then play chess as that character. So it's also putting on an, al al an alter ego. Um, but yeah, no, I've I've read stories of like how chess can have an incredible transformative effect on people. Like I think there was a there was a village in India or something where this guy introduced chess, and within like half a year, like their incidence of crime and alcoholism went down. Um, it, it totally changed this village around. Um, so and and chess has a has a very personal connection for me because when I was a kid, my dad used to teach me you know, and play with me. So I have, you know, it's it's a way of for me to connect to my father. I think chess is a very powerful anchor point. It can also be different, different other things like sports, but it's about mastery and about focusing on something and just being in flow and not think of anything else. And I think that really does something with us. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, so I also we'll really like that. E -learning. We'll yes. be teaching in e-learning or something. And Douglas, uh, he's also interested in philosophy. So yeah, you've got like a tribe here within your tribe. Um, yeah. Is this, is this the startup that you are working on? Uh, yes. Okay. So what I'm really interested in is also the power of alter egos. And that's also what I do when I teach kids. Um, I, I try to take at least two um, uh, teaching um, engagements with, with schools because it just always vitalizes me and I just love to see their passion. And then I sometimes dress up as a superhero and, and then we're doing the superhero um, school for um, environmental heroes and, and that's just such fun and just and then you can also see their intrinsic motivation, their passion to do well and then also some little extrinsic parts where they want to win um, collecting more trash than the other kids and it's just such a such a beautiful experience and, and insights on the human personality. And I, and I still find that in university students, they still have that urge to do well. And what happens often is that we get lost in these, um, in these paradoxes. We cannot earn our lives and support our families by doing something good. Doing something good is something we can do as a hobby. And and I have always believed it can go differently. And that's also part of my teaching. This is why I am a sustainability specialist, but I'm much more into the well-being aspect and into the kind of going into the core elements of what makes us um, be more prone to act well for our society. And one important aspect to me is now also teaching people on subjects like ikigai, so doing what they love, because that's that's something also, um, you'll be less prone to burnout if you if you have that sense of autonomy, of passion, of magic. Um, and obviously you need some rituals which make you not go too crazy on your work, but um, that's a different subject. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I would love to, to learn about some of these rituals that you can use to prevent burnout. Um, it's yeah. Could we yeah, talk a bit more yeah. about the anti-burnout rituals and other rituals that you talk about, like rituals for reciprocity and win-win? Like, I think there's so many things that we can jump into right now. Like, yeah, I think this is going to be a great discussion. Of course, this is already a very, yeah. a very interesting discussion. Um, where do I start? So let's say these obvious things like getting a good eight or seven, eight hours of sleep this is already a very important thing and also scheduling in time for your loved ones so i've noticed that in myself um i get really passionate about my work and in theory i do spend quite a bit of time with my kids but then i'm less present and so what i do is my agenda now includes my kids and this is where i block my phone and sometimes it's just 20 minutes i'm just talking aside of meals or whatever um and that's already enough to fill the reservoir of feeling I have really been there. Um, and these are the kinds of things like rituals also with your spouse or with your friends. You need to, when you get really passionate about your work, you need to schedule these things in. And there are some non-negotiables. And as I said, sleep is one of them. Eating healthily is one of them. Exercising. And that's also something I've noticed about myself that um, if I get too much trapped in work, I do work and I do my kids, but I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll just cut the, the, the physical routines. Um, and meditation or some kind of mindfulness routine um, can, uh, it is are proven to be very helpful. Um, and then if we want to go more into the nitty gritty details, um, in order to be really productive and feel well and not all over the place, it's also important that you have time for reflective time as opposed to responsive time. So if you schedule in two hours or one hour of completely uninterrupted deep work, that will really um, increase your productivity. Um, so that's something I try. I'm not saying I always manage it, but I it has changed my life. And that is that there are times where I will answer all my LinkedIn's, my emails, my social media, and then I'll go into deep work and try to cut off everything else. Um, and that's uh, that's very very helpful to not always be in the state where um, messages can arrive all the time. 
<clears throat> yeah, no, I mean, I feel a lot of these things are things that people already know and like they, but it's like, it's so hard to actually uh, have the commitment to do it and also to be, to feel supported by your society. Uh, I'm, I'm curious how, like it feels to me that Europe is probably one of the better places in which to feel supported, like being having a space to have these rituals because, you know, it's as a society, Europe is already kind of going towards that social democracy. Uh, you know, they're more like green parties in Europe uh, compared to elsewhere. So I, I feel in Europe, the politics is converging on this, I don't know, sense of like uh, making people's well-being like very important. Uh, what's your sense? Um, if I may say that first, I think a lot of these well-being practices come from Asia, speaking yoga, speaking Qigong, all of that acupuncture, so all that kind of knowledge from going from within, keeping the system healthy, releasing energy. It comes from Asian cultures, and I think in European cultures, because burnout rates have been so high, because people have been pushing themselves to the limit, there's a need. Um, and what I still see as a challenge is that we have well-being programs as opposed to a well-being culture. So it's true that firms send their employees to some kind of well-being programs and there's some kind of team bonding thing. So they're really, sometimes they're a bit, I think the intentions are good, but not necessarily always effective because um, it also requires bigger changes. So I know for instance, in a Parisian context, it's normal that your boss still writes you an email at 10 in the evening, and it's normal that you respond to that one. Um, so th these are the kinds of subjects we need to speak about, about work hygiene, about hours, and then afterwards, work has been work, and we need to set our boundaries. Um, I, I, I think um, this is a really, really interesting subject, and it's, it's something we really need to change the mentality on different levels because a lot of employees, they also don't dare to set these boundaries. Because again, there's that peer pressure. And also nowadays we identify a lot with our work and our success in work. And so we don't want to be that lazy person or we don't want to go part-time. So all these subjects that weigh on us. And micromanagement is something in France, you can find that a lot. Um, and what happens, for instance, if we micromanage our kids? Do they grow up to be independent, confident beings? And the same happens here. I, I think that, again, brings us back. Even if you're in a job that you don't totally love, if you have a sense of recognition, trust, and autonomy, this goes a long way. I don't know whether I answered your question. Yeah, no, no, you did. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, it's really interesting how you're, you know, you highlight the importance of things like trust and autonomy. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've been very interested in exploring different, like, decentralized ways of organizing, like, sociocracy. Um, I don't know if, if you've heard of that term, but... Um, Would you tell me a bit more about it? I've heard yeah. about it, but... So sociocracy is a governance system uh, created by uh, a Dutch guy, Gerard Endenberg, uh, and I think in the 1950s, and he based it on engineering principles, biology, cybernetics. Uh, but yeah, it, it's really about giving people um, autonomy over uh, their own work. So they make decisions about their own work. It's not set by a boss. Um, so there's, there's very little power hierarchy. Uh, decisions are made through consent. And they have a lot of, they actually run a lot of schools uh, according to uh, soci sociocratic uh, methods. And yeah, everyone's organized in circles and the circles are linked. And so some people actually think that sociocracy can be scalable to the point where you can actually run an entire country using it. And there will be much more like democratic accountability I love that. And that's also something I've been wondering recently, um, at least in a related way. Um, if we think about rules and regulations or the 10 um, commandments, um, 
we wouldn't need to have this much if we all felt we are part of a community that we want to protect. If you look at villages, um, no one would just throw garbage on the ground, not because um, you will be fine, but because that's not something you want to do, it's your village. Um, and how can we get back to that state? Or um, my kid wouldn't want to steal from my bag, not because I will punish him otherwise, but because he just loves me and he just doesn't want to do something like this. And how can we get more and more into that kind of state? I've noticed, for instance, in the UK, um, they even alert you that you could fall off the stairs if you don't hold on to the railing. And as ridiculous as it sounds, um, I have friends who once said that they almost got scared when there wasn't a railing and something alerting them that um, stairs can be dangerous. And, um, and this is what happens to us. Um, it happens to kids, it happens to us as grown-ups. The more people think for us and the less autonomy we feel, the more we kind of just get, get into that unactivated, passive, uh, lazy teenager state where we're just like, no, okay, okay, I'll just put my socks into, um, into the drawer because you're asking me to. It's, there's this there's the state, but Whereas if we feel activated, we are part of something, then there's, all, there's less friction. And how do we get there? Because let's say in France, we are very micromanaged. Um, if we now talk about the crisis, for me as a German, it was really hard that during daytime, I was only allowed to go out for one hour and there was police checking on attestations. And for me, this is, at, and at the same time, I could see um, French people not at all respecting the um, the rules and regulations as well. So there was this this kind of, and I think both of them are linked with each other. Too little trust leads to too many breakings of law, and mm -hmm. um, and and so how can we mindfully get to that kind of society of trust and love? In that is the tension between shared ownership when we share ownership over our land, our natural environment, the people around us, and whatever gifts and assets that we all have versus individual possessions, you know, the things that we possess. So if, if this is a tension that we've all in, I feel like what's going on in Europe right now is the aftermath and the consequence of a few powerful forces in history, colonialism, which was a very big, powerful force, is now coming back and hitting Europe back. So, yeah. So, I mean, like what you said, right? A lot of these ancient practices like yoga and meditation, and they all, they were already like in the places the colonial masters went to, to occupy. People there were already living in harmony and in, in collective ownership of their lands and the people around them. They were already taking care very well of, uh, the, the immediate uh, community, you know, and yeah, I think, so that's one force, which is colonialism. Then the other force is the industrial revolution. And in the industrial revolution, you have the assembly line. And in the assembly line, you're micromanaging. You have to manage for perfection. And then you are built on efficiency and effectiveness. And this is where you say, like, it's this whole instant gratification culture whereas healing cannot be instant yeah so yeah so that's the first force which was colonialism and then you had the industrial uh, revolution and then you had probably capitalism as well with its origins in uh yeah in the uk so i think yeah it, these are like forces of the european colonial masters that are coming back and heating them back and that's causing them a rethink and actually, yeah, it's appropriating the, the practices of the pre-colonial era of where they went to, actually. Yeah, they're turning to the answers from the pre-colonial era, which was the areas and the places where they, they were. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a quite, for me, that's how I view it and that's how I model it. But yeah, maybe there are other perspectives, but it's beautiful to see this. Something really interesting what you just said, um... I think one effect was also a mind-body disconnect. Um, in, in all these, I think um, in all these 
so-called primitive cultures, um, people were pretty much in their bodies. And I, um, I think also some colonial powers were almost a bit, um, found that very primitive, very vulgar. And I think our society has moved more and more about giving a lot of power to our heads. And, um, and I think it's really not serving our society. So now we are, most of us are sitting in front of the computer and we're not moving our bodies. I mean, there's now some, we have some new knowledge. We know yoga is important. It's important to move, but we are in, a, in, a, in an environment where we are basically giving a lot of power to our heads and all of the other things are just extras. And I think it has, our society has paid for that pretty heftily. Um, and it's difficult to get back to that. Um, and, and even with our kids, they want to move, but what we do, we quieten them, we, we set, set them in front of a laptop or an iPad. And um, it's, it's very, it's, I think it's really interesting to move further to that um, and, and, and connect both parts. Um, both of them are important, but also if you look, our brains take up a lot of our vital energy. And um, how do we calm it? Because it is stressful to keep on thinking through this year. Um, and something um, you both have, have been speaking about somatic experience. And, um, what I find really interesting is um, looking at the body's messages. I used to not um, notice them or listen to them. They were just there. But now if I think about it, since when I was small, I remember how my chest got tight or my throat got tight or my tummy got tight, like feeling a little lump there. And all of that is a pre-verbal and very intelligent force that is trying to um, communicate with me. And obviously I should use my mind as well in trying to listen to them, but I shouldn't just disregard them. Um, so this could be some kind of self-gaslighting otherwise. And, and how do we get there? And something which I find very, very impressive and groundbreaking is the power of shaking. Um, just shaking our limbs. Um, um, there's Peter Levine. Um, uh, I, I listened to an audiobook of his and it just felt so logical. So when we are stressed, we're basically in fight, flight, freeze mode. And in order to break the cycle, our bodies need to move or fight. Otherwise, we stay in this freeze response, which makes us more and more disconnected, looking at our phones, feeling a bit bad, but we're just like disconnected. And just something as simple as shaking our arms and legs can really bring us more into that present state. And this is why coming back to self-care rituals, move, let's move, let's shake, let's dance, let's do these things that connect us to our body. Let's not see the body as something separate from our minds. And also I, I saw you in the Gestalt sessions. I, I, I think you also try to move a little bit when learning. And I think that's, and, and that's also something I try to do when I'm teaching, inviting my students to move a little bit at times. Because if you just sit still, you just listen from here. But you, ha you can have a much deeper experience if you're moving at times. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree with everything you, you said. I mean, it's actually one of the things that I, I really want to, like, try to communicate to people if I can, you know, to... To, I don't know, just to tell people that you are more than just your brain. You are your whole body. Um, you know, like your gut <clears throat> sends 80% of the signals to the brain rather than the other way around. So it actually, we are driven by a gut. Um, and yeah, you know, I, I agree with you that it's, unfortunately, we've caught ourselves in this trap because our entire culture has been built by the brain to mirror itself. So when we look out, or it's like our brain is just seeing itself and reinforcing itself, which is why children's IQ scores keep going up every 10 years. No one can explain why, but it's because we've created a culture that is self-reinforcing. It's almost like the brain has become this tyrant in a castle, this megalomaniac that is creating this self-serving world. And, you know, so we have to somehow get away from that and dethrone the brain um, and put our, our guts back in charge. Absolutely. There's something interesting. Um, my daughter, when she was five, she was expected to already write in cursive language. And she had just come from the UK. And in France, she, she didn't quite master the French language yet. Mm -hmm. So it was really difficult. 
and she was made to feel really stupid. So her teacher was very worried that my five-year-old couldn't write the whole date yet. Or and um, and I, I see these five, six, seven-year-old kids who speak and think at a magnificent level. At the same time, I also sense they are far too scared to get their clothes dirty, to move. They they don't have that intuitive trust in their bodies or to fall and sometimes have an open knee. And, and that's something I've tried to do with my kids to kind of rather give them the confidence to climb and sure also inform them about the dangers. Um, so my, my daughter and me, we have the rule, you can climb up as far as you want, but you need to be able to come down again. And, um, and, and so these kinds of innate uh, building that innate competence and confidence in our bodies is something that I think we under, um, undervalue nowadays. I can see it also with myself. Um, I, I, I trust my mind quite often more than my body. Um, and this is what I was re recognized for. I'm intelligent and this. Um, mm. And I'm, I live in the city context. And um, when there's a problem, I tend to go back to the brain. So now I've, I've, I've started hacking it by, for instance, giving myself mini naps. Um, there are a lot of scientists who actually use that. And that is, take a question to your subconscious and let it do its magic. Don't try to just because it's not coming like frantically going for it. No, just take some space and give space to your subconscious. And, and this is something which has given me a lot of solutions. I wake up with a solution to a problem. And that's really um, something I, I think we, um, we also underestimate the same as old wisdom. Um, I mean, it's all been there, yoga, um, or listening to the gut, um, intuition. My gut and my intuition is telling me that future Breaking the Spell episodes will be done uh, in movement. So we'll no longer be sitting still, having a conversation like this. We'll be having one episode while dancing with our guests and another episode while we're having a walk in nature. Another episode where we we're climbing some trees and we're hugging some trees. And yeah, so that, that's going to be the, the, the structure of Breaking the Spell, YouTube channels, uh, future episodes. Yeah, but you're right. I think uh, this, this began with uh, Descartes' uh, mind-body dualism. Yeah, so the mind is separate from the body and the mind should rule over the, bo the body. Uh, je pense donc je suis cogito ergo sum. I think therefore I am you know, which makes my existence and my being restricted to the thoughts in my mind. Yeah, whereas in the ancient and Eastern traditions, it's I am because I am, you know, my exist, I exist because I exist, I am, you know, or I am, therefore I am. And so it's, it's, it's really like Descartes' mind-body dualism and the split between the mind and the body and yeah, I, I, I personally feel quite disconnected from all parts of my body. And um, yeah, it's also not just like by, by intelligence, right? Like the, the head and the gut, but it's distributed. It's all over the body. Like it's intelligence all over. And yeah, we, it's non-local. So we can't localize it here and localize it in the gut, but it's all over. And every part of this human intelligence can inform us so much uh, about the kind of future society we want to design and co-create. Yeah, and um, I can see us doing this in sociocratic circles where we make decisions uh, for the benefit of society. So yeah, I think there's just a lot of potential. When you talk about disconnect, um, I think it's really interesting to look at what triggered you in believing it is better to not feel your body and this is um this is not a question you need to answer it's just a question that our listeners may find interesting and once you go into that you wait to it you give your subconscious the time um often images pop up and then you can also shake them off um and just just do that work because for, at some period in your life, it was the smarter thing to not feel. Um, and I know about myself, I had to go through so many things I didn't want to do. It felt easier to not feel that resistance all the time when I was younger. 
And then you can just get stuck in that thing that served you at some point. I think for a lot of people, uh, it's even challenging to imagine what listening to your body is like, like, what does that even mean? You know, I think, uh, I mean, I've spent years and years, like, I don't know, trying to access my body. So like, I, I feel like, uh, I have a little bit of understanding, but I can imagine for people who have never even, uh, explored it, like even just instruction, listen to your body, it would be very alien to them. And, and sometimes I, I even wonder like the language, like listen to your body, does that prioritize the head too much because is it still being in our heads it's like our head is listening to the body you know it's it's so it's not so much about listening to your body but just being your body it often starts like that that it's our brain like how am i supposed to do this now let's do something very just something small um do we all like chocolate in this room i love chocolate yes what about you santosh yeah yeah I like so chocolate. so now just feel the chocolate like locate a point in your chest and now say, I hate chocolate. I hate chocolate. Just kind of go into it. And just I hate feel, chocolate. I hate chocolate. What, I just hate feel chocolate. what it does to your chest. And now say, I love chocolate. I love chocolate. I love, I love chocolate. chocolate. Oh, um, what it does to me when I say I hate chocolate, there's like a closing, which is like, no, 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 but you, you love chocolate, no, no, no. <laughs> Whereas I love chocolate, it's like, yeah, you do. And this is just a very small little thing telling you your little truth. And when it gets closed, while you're exchanging with someone, um, it could be even something you want to believe in, but if it's closed, it's something to listen to. It doesn't mean um, it's always the first level answer, but it's at least something to listen to. Or if you feel danger, maybe you, you can remember that time. Just imagine yourself being in that alley. It's dark. You see that group of young youngsters who have, draw, um, who have quite a bit of alcohol on them. You're alone. Just if you, if you have that kind of image in front of you, now focus on your tummy area. Can you feel a little bit of clenching or is it your, is it your throat? Like um, these are these little ways or you're in a setting and you're in danger and, but people are saying things against values that are dear to you. Maybe something racist, maybe something about someone you love, but you feel you cannot express your truth. Maybe you'll feel something in your throat here. And these are these little ways our body communicates with us. And it's our mind who has made it a bit woo-woo because it's not really that backed up by science yet, even though there is more and more science, for instance, by the HeartMap Institute, showing there's, there's some, some truth and some, some wisdom. But uh, these are these little ways of starting to get to know yourself because what I've noticed in quite a few of my clients, they just look for like the diet for them, the, um, the supplements they need. They just like want to be told, but there's no one fits all solution. I mean, there are things which are clear, like don't have too much sugar, don't drink too much. I mean, there are these things which are kind of clear, but there is a way of our body to tell us, okay, this is good now for us. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, one of the things I've, I've been exploring this year is like uh, some shamanistic practices, working with energy, and it is, yeah, I think it's really powerful work. I, I, I think everyone should explore it. Like, yeah, the, the areas where you contract in your body, um, you know, and how do you open those areas up, I think can be very powerful work. Um, and yeah, I, I like what you said about like asking, like, you know, checking with the truth in your body, like, you know, whether you love chocolate or hate chocolate. Um, like one of the <clears throat> shamanistic practices that I came across was, uh, you know, you ground yourself to the earth, right? So that's grounding like on, you know, underneath your feet to the core of the earth. And then you also connect to the divine uh, sort of 
anchor up in the sky, like, you know, uh, up in the heavens, and you have this straight line, right? And there's a cord that passes through your heart, connecting the ground and the cosmos. And that's your truth cord. And, you know, you can test that. Like, you can see, like, what, if it vibrates in a certain way, if you ask it a question. Uh, so, I don't know. I mean, it, it's like, these are things that it may work for some people and it may not work for others, but I have fun exploring them for sure. I think it's also about having that curiosity and opposite of perfectionism, just kind of, it could be nothing for you, but why not just try it out a little bit and observe yourself in these little small scale um, interactions during your day. And um, the concept I find really interesting um, and Santosh and me, we have spoken about it already. It's a biocycle in us as well. So um, after 90 minutes, or it, it depends, you have a little moment of fatigue. And often I notice that I just want to make myself a new coffee. And I've just, since I know about it, I realize, okay, I just need five minutes uh, of doing nothing, a little meditation, a mini nap. Um, and and then I'm, I'm back fresh. So these are the ways where we fight against our exhaustion as opposed to just going with it, going with the flow, giving it a little pause and then going back. And there's some fear about if I now lean into my exhaustion, I just not be productive at all. But we can work with these, with these, uh, with these signals of our body. Um, this is, yeah, this is exactly what the, the owner of the production line or the assembly line, he doesn't want you to listen to your body. He, he doesn't want you to listen to your truth. He wants you to keep on working efficiently as many hours as possible so that you can, he can extract as much out of you for the capitalist agenda. So it's, um, yeah. And then they will, I think, even if we try to do that, I mean, try to go back to our bodies, there'll be a wave of fear, and these are all the fears we were told by everyone, like, don't follow your truth. You know, um, the grass is not greener on the other side. Yeah. And you had also talked about this whole idea of risk. I think we were, we were once, uh, I mean, we, ha we had an exchange previously and it's this fear of anticipating the worst or protecting oneself from liability. Uh, we have a culture of blame appropriation and attribution and an aversion to failure. Uh, for example, we're told to go and get educated and get a stable job. Or, yeah, like I think uh, your kid uh, had, a, had to go for an event uh, or something. And then there were all of these forms that were needed to be filled. And it's all about protecting from liability. So mm -hmm. it's, it's just this, this barriers we've built up and it's tough. Yeah, even as we listen to our bodies, we, we have doubt. Like, is this it? You know, because it's, it's really a new path and we've not walked on this. It's, it's, yeah, very novel and out of our comfort zone. And no one else is doing this. I mean, very few people are doing this. So we rather follow the crowd. Yeah, <laughs> unless we have a tribe that has all of this modeled unto us and the way we feel, wow, there is an example and I can be like them. Sorry, Sandra. It's um, you're raising several really relevant points. So there's this um, again coming back to rules and regulations, where for the smallest thing you have to um, sign some insurance declarations that in case of death you'll um, do not sue them. Um, so I also think that this is doing something to us as a society where everything can be a legal claim if um, and, and, and so that also for instance uh, there are schools where the teachers can't hug a kid because it it could imply too many things or men cannot uh, cannot play with other kids because that could mean something so we are always prepared for the worst and forget that the probability for the worst is pretty low and also we actually increase the probability by a space, I think, um, which um, which is around all this fear mongering, um, 
and and about ourselves about risking it it's again getting out of the narrative that has been giving to us given to us um in my case again through all that adversary uh, experiences i had as a child i my my motivation to change that was high enough because i just couldn't stand that life there and so i i um I did a lot of things to change that. And um, I also find it, I, I observe a lot of people ending up in jobs they really don't like, but that they see as a safety net. And let's just imagine the potential for transformation in the society if more people could be doing what they love. Um, I'm obviously not telling everyone to just give up their jobs and uh, just do what they love. They need there, there needs to be a process. Um, there needs to be an MVP. There needs to be um, there needs to be some kind of strategy, and there needs to also be some kind of risk assessment. But that shouldn't be fear based, but um, rather like an introspective checkup and getting feedback. And what I've noticed is I have quite a few clients who are very successful in their 40s and their 50s where they just notice, okay, I just can't do this anymore. It just, I just can't. And they have all the skills that are worked in big corporations and they need meaning. And, and, and I think these kinds of people, they are very willing to even accept a cut in pay to do something they really love. And they need some direction. But what if we had a society which um, helped us more co-create projects and work ethics and um, corporations which which integrated that sense of purpose for our employees? It's, um, I also hope for these students that I teach um, that they actually have that expectation of life to do something they love and don't instantly identify it with something stupid they can never earn money with. Um, and, and this looks different for everyone else. It can be that you're part of a cool startup or an NGO. Um, it can be that having that freelancer life that I'm having, um, it all has some shadow sides to it, but I, would I do it again? Definitely, yes. I would do it a little bit more smarter, smartly, but I would do it again. Yeah, and no, I think the great tragedy of our times is that so many people <laughs> are forced to choose between either financial suicide or spiritual suicide. You know, either, yeah, you have a, a, a job that <clears throat> keeps you going, but then you know, it doesn't meet your values, or if you want to lead a value driven life, it you can't financially sustain yourself. Um, and it, it's so hard. I, I actually believe in, we need something like universal basic income, I think, where people's basic needs are just taken care of. And I think we would be yeah, like, like you, I, I believe we would be surprised at how much human flourishing would happen. And how many people aren't just going to be free riders, like I think innately, we want to contribute. Uh, we want to contribute to each other. And it's just that our current society is set up that in a way that inhibits us from doing that. Yes. Yeah, that also brings us back to um, these two parts in our brains. I think we want to contribute. A free rider aspect is also in us, but we need to have that environment also that recognizes and loves and encourages this kind of contribution, create a creation, service, acts of kindness. If I feel I'm well, I can do it. But if I feel it's me or you, then I'll be less prone to do that. And, and the same has been proven about home office. Um, there have been sufficient amounts of studies which show that it's very beneficial for a company culture to offer that as an option to your employees. But corporations were just far too scared. Because what would happen? Will, will, the, will the employees just do siestas and just lays off? Um, so the, the crisis has shown there's a lot of benefits to it. And I want to explicitly say that doesn't mean you put your employees into one Zoom conference after the other. This is really harmful and uh, exhausting, but rather um, also give them some time for projects, for work, and, and kind of let them just surprise you. Yeah, um, there are numerous experiments um, which have happened in real life. Dan Price of Gravity Payments, um, he was startled. He's a CEO of uh, this financial um, services company. 
very startled to know that the lowest rank of its employees were not paid enough wage to have a sustainable uh, living. And so he, he created a minimum like 7,000 and he, he, uh, he took a huge pay cut to make sure everyone got a, a decent minimum wage. And, you know, on one hand, like there were so many critics, like this is not going to work. Your workers are going to just take you for granted. Yeah, but the company grew year on year and more successful um, than previously when they had huge disparities in wealth and income in the organization. And so having a, like a, a universal net, safety net from which, uh, or un- income from which a- everyone is taken care of, gives everyone a, a decent amount of psychological safety and security to experiment, to take risk and to come up with new innovative ideas that can be the next value creation opportunity that will bring in more revenues and profits for the company. And Dan Price is a wonderful like CEO of a startup who has proven this. Google in the past used to have this uh, Friday, like, um, like Friday, um, do your own experiment time. Yeah, so on Fridays, they would like, uh, yeah, spend some time on your pet projects. And that's where all these amazing new products that Google came up with, like Gmail and Google Maps and so many amazing things came out from the protected time they got to experiment that was out of what their normal structured uh, roles and responsibilities uh, revolved around. And so there's just so many numerous examples of if you give them trust and autonomy, yeah, they will, they will surprise you. Um, in Netflix, they have a beautiful culture. They have a culture code. And all of this culture code is written on their website. Yeah, and it, it's all about liberating your employees. And um, the chief officer, like the people officer or human resource organization development officer, she wrote a book around empowerment or powerful yeah so she said that actually people don't need to be empowered that is the old people are actually very powerful you need to let go of your desire to empower them they are powerful to begin with you know it's about how do we channel one another's power yeah so i think uh, there was a book that was written powerful by one of the ex um um, members, critical members of uh, Netflix culture building team. Yeah, so there's just so many amazing examples of this being implemented in the capitalist corporate world. <laughs> they have uh, appropriated all of these ideas. and So it's definitely possible. It is, and, and there, there are also studies showing that um, only in these kind of industry settings, um, what you were describing, where you're um, where you're just doing one, uh, the same tasks the whole time, um, some kind of extrinsic rewards actually make you more productive. Um, that's sort of a carrot stick approach. Whereas um, in, these, in these spaces where you need to be creative, um, it's only through intrinsic rewards of feeling recognized and autonomy where you, um, where you reach the most uh, benefits and um, productivity um, increases. Um, I think with Google, it's 20% of their time that, that they can allocate on pet projects. I just love it. This, this is a um, secret sauce to their unique. success. But there is inherently something that's holding us back because we don't trust them. Like, yes. you know, what if they abuse it? Yeah. And this is the, you know, the, this is again the slave mentality, right? The person who owns the slave, you can't trust the slave you have to hold the slave in chains because you can't trust them. Yes. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's slavery and then capitalism, and, yeah. And there's you also a transition. Trust. So people or even children, they need time to, um, to adjust to that new system. Maybe they'll abuse it at first, but once they understand they're part of it and they can trust it, this will change it. And there, there'll always be people who abuse it, but that happens in all contexts. And they shouldn't be used as examples against it, but rather something to just bear in mind and work with. Um, but I don't think it works with uh, my two nephews. Uh, I mean, I can give you one concrete example. Uh, so one is uh, um, five years old and the other one is seven years old. They'll come over on the weekends and like they want to watch TV, right? So we'll say, okay, um, half an hour or one hour 
like 45 minutes, right? And then after that, it's out, no more TV. And they say, yes, yes, after that, no more, no more television. <laughs> but guess what? After 45 minutes, they want to watch more and more and more. So like, <laughs> then I am like, I get back to both of you talking about trust. Trust them and they will figure a way out. <laughs> Then I have my control mindset, right? No, no, no. I need to control the situation. I need to cut off television time. Yeah. So it's it's a bit of a war that I have within myself. Oh, yes, just remind yourself. Yeah. Children Sorry, want yeah. boundaries. Yeah. Yes, they need them. And also need adults that enforce them. We need to be smart about what kind of boundaries we set. Because sometimes they're easily set and they're not enforced. We need to set few, but then also um, enforceable ones. And uh, screens are a really good example. Kids can't handle them. I mean, even grown-ups can very often not handle them. But for kids, it's very addictive. So um, it's it's important to give them that um, that uh, it just just switch it off. When you said thirty minutes or forty-five minutes, it needs to be clear that you enforce that. Yeah, what if I was like you enforce a boundary and then they'll have a meltdown, they'll cry, but you know, that's where you just stay close to them. Let them cry. Don't, you know, don't tell them not to cry. And, and yeah, they just need to process it and then they'll be fine. And handle the frustration. And it's it's often hard for us as grown-ups because for us it's a low stake uh, situation um to to kind of go through um, and accompany these intense emotions. I mean, at least I'm, I'm speaking about myself. For me, that can be hard to see that. But I've realized once you've gone through that a few times, also the duration of their frustration will decrease. And, and, and this avoids future, um, future conflict. And something interesting is we need autonomy and freedom, but it doesn't mean we need to be in that situation where we can start to be... Um, uh, like uh, we, we can be completely arbitrary like uh, dictators in a banana republic um, we need to um, really also have some boundaries and feel them so it needs to be clear that if I abuse my company too much that will have consequences it's not just about carrot stick and punishment but I think we need some of both wow I've learned so much about parenting like, well, I think yeah. we've uh, we've learned a lot in this conversation, and yeah, uh, yeah no, I'd, I'd like to find a way to to bring it to a natural close. Um, I mean, Shanta, like I, you know, I feel you you are such a storehouse of knowledge, and uh, you know, I'm just so glad that you are doing what you do, and um, uh, you know, for the sake of our viewers, like. Is there a, a single, like a one place where they can go to find out all these different things that you offer and little, so many nuggets, so many tidbits that I would, I would love to, to access? Um, a good place would probably be shantamayanandi.com, which is a, more like a um, professional page, which gives some insights on what I do. And uh, I'm also always open for a conversation. So if, um, yeah, if someone feels inclined to contact me on LinkedIn or my website, I'll be very happy to hear from them. Great. Did you have any closing remarks you wanted to uh, give to book in our conversation? All that fear and frustration we are feeling at the moment in us about society against others, against ourselves, um, there lies gold behind it, which we can transform. And this is also when Santosh talks about alchemy, this is also a personal kind of alchemy we can do. Let's look at the underlying need behind that negative emotion and, and look where that leads us. I like that. Thank you so much. Wow, that's beautiful. Uh, it reminds me of David White's um, poem on grief. And uh, yeah, there's so much beauty in all of this. Yeah. The wound is where the light will shine by Rumi as well. And yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that goal. That gem is powerful. Very, very powerful. Because inherently I have a resistance to like negative feelings and emotions like grief and sadness and anger and all. But there's so much power there's so much uh, hidden message and meaning. 
thank you so much for that. Yeah, I like that the idea of alchemy, um, and you know, I, I but yeah, we're in a period of transformation. Um, and there, you know, I think what has come out for me in this conversation is there are no magic bullets, no silver bullets. You know, it it really is just we. It's all the little things that we have to combine uh, with the right intention and the right values. Yes, and when we feel we don't belong, we just need to look a bit further. And then um, sometimes you find alleys and places you never suspected. And to me, it has happened, for instance, with uh, meeting you, Santosh, and I have the impression um, it could be similar with you and Sue. It's um, been very rewarding and inspiring to exchange with both of you. And I'm looking forward to the next time, whether it's a recorded one or one just amongst the three or four of us. Okay, great. Thank and thank you for yeah for coming on our show. Thank you, Santa. Yeah. Anytime. Um, and yeah, I'm I'm sending you all a lot of love from Paris and <laughs> meet you anywhere. You too. <laughs> yeah. Take care. Hope hope to meet meet up physically one day. Yeah. In yes, person. yes. Please let me know if you're ever in Europe or Paris. It would be such a pleasure. I okay. will go into the forest and do some movement and dancing yeah, and whatever. <laughs> That's what we do. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.